like a dick man. Dispatches from Planet Funk. This is the Aced Out Podcast. Dedicated to all whom the man tried to ace out. By profiting from the soul. Without stopping to give props to the prophets of soul. Can you dig that? This is Ace Allen. Sometimes they call me Barack Wizzing. And we're brought to you by the letter P. And we're sponsored by Pete. P-E-T-E. Otherwise called... People for the Ethical Treatment of Ear Holes. Everybody around me is Funk and Not Fam affiliated. Because Funk is just fun with the K. That's why they pronounce it Funky. What do you think about that, Jay? Uh, Jay's not here because I'm just recording this quick little intro. Uh, we're about to get to me and Jay in the studio right behind me here at Different Fur with Rusty Allen, best known from Sly and the Family Stone, but he's doing his own thing now, playing in the purple ones, a tribute to Prince with the new power generations, Levi Caesar Jr. That's this episode. That's this interview. And they're doing a live performance, too. Bam! Mind blown already, right? Well, let me just tell you a couple more things. So um, our next episode is episode 30. We're interviewing somebody who's very special to me, Ricky Vincent. Ricky is the man. Ricky is the author of Funk, The Music, The People, and The Rhythm of the One. He also wrote Party Music the inside story of the Black Panthers band and how Black Power transformed soul music. Uh, Ricky Vincent's also the host of the History of Funk show every Friday nights on KPFA on the radio, but also broadcast all around the world. And he's the funky professor, the Uhuru maggot. You know, we already wrapped production on that interview, so I happen to know that it went fantastic. And we already had a brilliant, in-depth, and lengthy powwow with Ricky Vincent. But that's not all. We also had killer performances with Jay Stone, myself, actually Jay's son Kyle Coyote on the drums, who also played in the Stevie P band last episode. And we represent the Funkonauts, of course, and we played with two Oakland-based rappers. We played with Dub Esquire, and my ace, my number one uh, homie, Monster, and also vocalist Mel Yell was in the mix as well. So we performed two songs live with them, and that was fantastic. And speaking of fantastic songs performed live, I want to give props to Stevie Pinnell for giving us a classic, fantastic, and just kind of deep episode, playing not one, not two, but three um, Funkadelic tunes with us right here in the studio. And that was absolutely beautiful. And congratulations to Stevie Pinnell. Thank you so much. And we hope to do it again soon. Let me also give props as usual to um, our post-production team. I'm talking about Nick Ways. I'm talking about you, Nick. You're editing me right now, making me look good. I'm talking about Three Charts, who does our graphics, who does our IT, who does our website, who does everything, really. Those are the MVPs of the Ace Out Podcast. Speaking MVP, making it all happen, we got Scott Shepard. <laughs> Scott Shepard, the exec in the mix for this particular episode. Uh, we used camera person and video production man, Sabor Bidar. So shout out to Sabor for filming this for us. Um, please, you guys, I want you to do two things for me. I want you to like and subscribe our YouTube channel. And do me a favor, when you check out this video, don't just watch it. I know you want to watch it. I know you want to listen to it. But drop us a comment. Tell, you, tell us how you feel, you know. You need that activity. Uh, so drop us a comment. Uh, check us out also. You can go to our YouTube page from acedoutpodcast.com. That's A-C-E-D-O-U-T-P-O-D-C-A-S-T dot com. Audio-only episodes are still popular on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, and TuneIn. But anyway, who cares about that? 
Let's get into this episode. This is a great episode. Let's cut to myself, Jay, Rusty, and Levi. You know, Jay Stone, we started this show way back in 2018. This is our 29th episode. 29. 29. Oh, my God. And we do big episodes. It's like a movie. And, you know, there was so much hate on the Internet and, you know, anger and depression in my heart about people's lives being treated like they don't matter, like their musical careers are being ignored or trivialized, you know. Right. And I really wanted to do something positive to counteract that. Uh huh. So I asked you to do the show with me. And, you know, speaking of that, in funk, we have a concept called the one, right? Right. And it's a nonlinear way of visualizing time where everything moves in a circle and then lands in the exact same place. Mm-hmm. For this podcast, right. Rusty Allen is the one who <laughs> landed back in the same place. Oh, wow. Remember, Rusty took a chance on us yeah, he and did. did our very first pilot episode For over sure. in Berkeley. Yeah. And uh, he just came out, didn't even know who we were, and just decided to give it a try. No he gave us a doubt. great, great interview. Uh, of course, Rusty is a legendary bass player. He replaced Larry Graham uh, just in time to record the phenomenal album Fresh. No doubt. He's an Oakland-raised bassist who cut his teeth playing with the group Little Sister featuring Vet Stone. And that was le- led by Freddie Stone, as you remember. He also plays on super underrated albums, in my opinion, Small Talk, one of my favorite albums of all time, yeah. and High on You. He also appears on that. Uh, after that, he went and played with Rose Stone, uh, backing her solo career. Uh, he fulfilled his Hendrix Power Trio fantasies by joining Robin Trower. <laughs> and that was a great band, version of the band, uh, appearing on Robin Trower's In City Dreams and Caravan, uh, Caravan to Midnight. Yeah. He's also recorded with The Temptations, Bobby Womack, uh, several reunions of the Family Stone, and he had his album, Remember, uh, which we were promoting at the time when we first had him, Simple Rules, which I believe he's remixed. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a mix of soul, funk, and hip-hop, and that features Freddie and a song also produced by George Clinton. Wow. Um, I also want to promote one of my new favorite shows on YouTube, Rusty Allen YouTube Show. Yeah. They've had four episodes so far, my friends, and I highly recommend that. You'll love it if you get to check it out. And that features in the co-pilot seat, a guy, I can't even believe he's here right now. <laughs> really? I don't even believe this is happening. Right. And you're sitting next to him over uh. there. Can we change places, man? <laughs> no, this is my man over here. We're the Allen, the Allen right. brothers here. Yeah. You're sitting next to Levi Caesar Jr. Man, come Welcome on, man. Welcome to you, my friend. Come the first on. time Thank talking you. to you. Glad to be here. And um, this is Kat. He started out with Sheila, you know, Sheila E. We interviewed Juan uh, Escovito earlier this year. Yep, we did. Uh, but then he was pulled over to Prince's New Power Generations. And he also leads a group that I saw uh, recently with Scott, the Purple Ones, a tribute to Prince with my man, Rusty Allen. Okay. So these guys are like road dogs now. That's right. <laughs> and uh, it was a, they're a great band, have a great set. I was just complimenting them on the set list. They even playing songs like Ladies Room and Lady Cab Driver in the set, mm, you know? Mm. So it was a great show. Um, they're also promoting a single with uh, D.D. Simon, uh, Rusty single, Gonna Take More. Yes. And I'm just so happy to have you both here. Please welcome Rusty Allen and Levi Caesar Jr. Let me just ask you guys first, um, when did you start doing the group together, the tribute group? How did that pull together? You guys are playing some great gigs. Like, How long have you guys known each other? Oh, quite a while, Mm -hmm. quite a while. Uh, The way the Prince thing happened was that uh, Levi called me because uh, uh, the bass player they were using had some type of problem. And uh, they needed somebody to come in right away because they had some gigs coming up. And, uh, uh-huh. So Levi gave me the music, and he gave me everything. He says, man, you got eight or nine days, man, for the first gig. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I'm telling you, arrangements, man. Serious right. arrangements and everything. I was like, okay. And so I studied and uh, did my first gig with them at Dan's Bar, I think in Walnut Creek a few years back. And, uh, and Levi said, man, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that's how we got started. You guys are a great team, and I love checking you out. Um, One thing I wanted to get since the show's a little bit, I'm talking about Aced Out Podcast, we're a little bit bigger now than when we first started with you, just a little bit. I'm glad. So I wanted to, thank you, man. I wanted to rehash a couple things that we talked about uh, that I thought were very interesting for anybody that hasn't checked us out yet. 
We had a really interesting discussion about 2006 Grammys that I wanted to bring back to the table. Okay. Um, I just want to talk about your experience with that. So you guys, if for all you meme heads out there, that's when you see a picture on Google of Sly Stone with a, a blonde mohawk. Remember right. that? And when he yeah. appeared on the Grammys, he right. came on the Grammys and everybody and their grandma was on the stage. He came out and performed a little bit, but then he left. So I wanted to back up and just talk about the experience with you first. So first of all, when did you find out, because it was the whole family stone back together, and when did you find out that that would be taking place, like right before, a year before, months before? Like- oh, just uh, basically right before, um, maybe a couple of weeks or so, and uh, I got the call. And uh, Where was that uh, filmed? That was at, in L.A. at uh, the Shrine or something. Mm-hmm. Okay. I wonder wherever, wherever they do that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I remember you said Larry did show up and then he left again. Yeah, yeah Larry did. Larry showed up. You know, we did a sound check and everything. And then Sly wanted Larry, so Larry Larry came. Uh, so I told Sly's manager, I think at the time it was Jerry Goldstein. I was like, man, cash me out and I'll leave. Right, right, right. right. I'm cool. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I want to see this myself, you know. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, and he said, no, no, man, just wait, just wait. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, Larry gets sick. And they said, you got to play. So I said, okay. Wow. All of a sudden you got sick. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's like he, he, I mean, he looked great to me. I mean, when he first walked in the building, <laughs> <laughs> he was like sound checking. He had a couple of Aguilars together, whatever. And he was like thumping, man. And the next thing you know, Larry got sick. I'm like, mm. in 10 minutes? Wow. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe something came up. Yeah. Now, how did, how did that rehearsal go then? Because what I'm leading up to is like a bunch of people got on stage when we did the actual performance. What were the rehearsals like at first? Were you getting love? Were you getting respect? Yeah, we, were, yeah we rehearsed at another uh, facility. I can't remember the name of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, yeah, we rehearsed. Sly showed up. You know, we practiced and everything. What were we wow. going to do? And uh was Sly, so Sly was fully present for that rehearsal? Yeah, or? yeah, he came, yeah. And, okay, but, but oh, the, okay, I didn't realize that. But the thing was, was that, you know, at that point, Larry wasn't even in the mix yet, you know, and then, but I guess in the back of Sly's mind, he really wanted the original band. So, mm-hmm. so, I mean, I was totally cool with that, but we rehearsed, but then when we got to the gig, I guess everybody was so thrilled to see Sly, and it was just, all the musicians wanted to be part of that, man, and that's what made him mad, because... That stage was supposed to be cleared off for right. Sly and the Family Stone exclusively. Wow. And everybody stayed. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, uh, Nile Rogers, he whispered in my ear, man. He was like, man, can I sing Larry's parts? <laughs> 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 so everybody was just geeking out. Everybody was geeking out, man. Patrice Russian, she stayed up there. There was a, some excellent horn players and stuff. I mean, it was like... You know, mm. just a, a mishmash, you know, of cats <laughs> up there. It was like, Sly was like, what is all of this? You know, so. Right, right. And uh, so you, I remember you said you didn't kind of didn't blame him for like leaving like that. No, I couldn't, yeah. man. I mean, you know, he wanted his band up there. I mean, right. it was like, you know, if it was anybody else, you know, they'd want, probably want the same thing, you know. One thing that frustrated me about that as just a viewer is... You know, that's great that everybody is excited, but I think if it was a different band, they wouldn't have done that. I think if they had like an Eagles reunion, oh, like right. they wouldn't have people standing in front of Joe Walsh. You know what I mean? Right, so, right, you know right. what I mean? You, you could even, I mean, Cynthia and, and Jerry got buried in the, uh, in the sea of people. I mean, you didn't even know where they were. You know, it was like crazy. Mm-hmm. What they should have done, uh, they, they should have had like a little moment for each member, I think, not just Sly, because Sly's vision of the band isn't just like a focus on him like a solo artist, right? Right. right. Right, wow. and that's what they turned it into later on. It was like you know, management and record company was like, well, that, it's nothing without Sly, so it's like all about Sly, right? And uh, that that could have been further from the truth. Right, you know? that wasn't exactly his vision. That's no, not not at all, at not all. at all. That's right. Wow, wow, well, that's an amazing experience, mm-hmm. and uh, thank you for uh, letting us know about that. What I want to ask you also about is because we didn't talk about it enough last time you're here is just how Little Sister came together and what's up with Little Sister. And uh, I know you got like kind of a version of that tune that we're going to be doing later. You're the one, I'm the one, you know, Little Sister. Right. Uh, By the way, you guys, Little Sister is a group, I believe, did Freddie put that group together originally? No, Sly put it together originally. But uh, Freddie ended up uh, kind of like taking it under his wing and making sure that, you know, 
they were rehearsed and the production was good. Got you. I saw you guys on one of the YouTube shows when you got you and Levi were talking. Um, you were trying to remember where you could hear some of the songs. So I do know somewhere where you can hear one, y'all. If you check out a CD that's called I'm Just Like You, Sly Stoned Flower. That's like a kind of a compilation CD, 1969 to 1970, y'all. I'm Just Like You, Sly Stoned Flower. It's got a picture of Sly playing the piano on the cover. And there's several Little Sister songs on that CD, which okay. I like to listen to. Yeah. Little Sister featuring Vet Stone. Tiny Mouton, Mary McCreary. Mary, Mary McCreary, yeah. And um, so let's bring it back, talk about Willie Wilde. You used to run around with Willie Wilde, be playing at Freddie's house yeah. when you'd be out of town? Yeah, well, when I first met Willie, Willie came down to my mom's house. I was staying with my mom. We're still teenagers, right? And so right. He came down and he says, man, I'm putting a band together. And I said, okay. And uh, next thing I know, I'm up at Freddie's house. I'm like, Wow. This guy lives with Freddie, right? And I hadn't seen or met Freddie at any point at that. But oh, you yeah, hadn't met him yet. Yeah, but but we started practicing and we started working. I mean, Willie was like a sly nut, right? I mean, everything that Sly did, he just adored. So we started working on Little Sister songs and Sly songs. And when I finally did meet Freddie, he was like, uh, yeah, we can, u- we can use this trio to back up Little Sister. And so he kind of like oversaw the uh, whole project. And uh, who else was in Little Sister? Was Willie Wilde the drummer for Little Sister? Yeah, Willie was playing drums. I was playing bass. Um, David Stallings on guitar? David Stallings was playing guitar. Great. And then um, one of your first shows I saw you guys talking about was opening for Sly in San Rafael? Yeah, Pepperland, yeah. Pepperland. Uh, yeah, that was, our, that was our first gig. And uh, wow, it was it was kind of like personal because, I, you know, I would have thought it would have been a larger venue, but actually right. it wasn't that large of a venue, but... And so people got to see Sly up close and everything, and uh, it was it was it was a great experience for me to uh, to have been on that show, man, and you know played with little sister, man. It was cool. I looked it up; it was like seven dollars fifty cents for that show. Wow, for really? <laughs> wow, man! It'd be like thirty wow. times that today. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, and then like a surcharge and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you started out with some instrumentals, and like the singers would come out. Is that how you yeah, do the show? Yeah, that's that's what happened. Freddie wrote a couple of instrumentals for us. I remember I was asking Freddie, I was like, man, we need some instrumentals, man. Can you write us something, man, with some odd time signatures and everything? He's like, yeah. You were requesting that? Yeah. He's like, yeah. So he wrote this thing we called Snap, man. And it had all these different time signatures and everything, but it was still hella funky, right? Uh, right. And, and it was like, okay. So, yeah, Freddie was up for any type of musical challenge you want to throw at him. <laughs> wow. Nice. And then... Um, there's a there's a funny story that I didn't know about you and Willie getting stranded in Philly or somewhere. Like they warned you, like you better be up in time for the yeah Sly's daddy. You know we we that was our first big show with little sister opening for Sly at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. Uh-huh. And uh, Sly's father told us, you boys better be ready to go in the morning. We're leaving at 6 (laughs) o'clock. And we're like, okay, okay. You know we in one end out the other, young and dumb. You know, and man. We woke up and they were all gone. And I was like panicking. And John Turk, with Sly, Holler, Sly hired John Turk to play trumpets. So Oh, he, he saved you, right? He saved right. us, man. He was the only one that had a credit card to get us to the airport. <laughs> Other than that, man, we would have been in Philly today. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> but yeah, they left, man. And they weren't playing, man. It was like, you know, I, that's when I learned my lesson. Never be late for lobby call. That's right. <laughs> Never. Never. Damn. Never. And no cell phones either. Now, one thing um, I saw is, Levi, you have a connection to Soul Train. Uh-huh. Um, can, you, can you explain that? Give us some background on that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> man, you're going way back now. <laughs> um, so back in the day, I used to play, before Rosie was with Prince, this is something I'm talking about way back. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I was in Rosie Gaines' band. Okay. And uh, you know Curtis Olson, bass player? Yeah, yeah. Local cat? Yeah, yeah. Bad. He, I mean, they, they eventually got married. But anyway, he was on bass. And I think William Kennedy was sitting in with us a Ooh. couple of times, yeah, for yeah. The Yellow Jackets. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was you know, it was going on, man. So um, um, so this one night, man, this is, you know, I was tell, tell musicians, you know, just make sure you get yourself ready. Don't don't try to put yourself in a place where something may happen. You just be ready, and then your your moment's gonna come. 
the question is, are you ready for that moment? Got you. And mm-hmm. so this was my 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 thing, what I'm getting ready to tell you. Okay. So <laughs> we're at a place called Earl Solano Club. It's closed now, but um I remember that. So I'm playing, you know, and it's jamming at night, you know, a lot of people. And I'm like, man, that guy in the back, he looks like Don Cornelius. <laughs> uh-huh. You know? Mm. And I'm like, yeah, but why would he be here, you know? Right. So night goes on, it's getting later and later, people starting to thin out. I'm like, that's I swear that's him. <laughs> you know? And now everybody's gone. They they you know, washing dishes and stuff. He's still there. And I'm now I got a good look at him. I'm mm-hmm. like, that's Don Cornelius. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so no I, I say, hey, you Don Cornelius? He said, Yeah. I said, man, what in the hell are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. You know? He says, well, uh, he said, I came to see you. Mm. I said, really? Say what? Wow. He said, um, really? He said, well, no, no, don't get me wrong. He said, I have some business in San Francisco, but I'm putting a band together. And I heard about you from a few people in the Bay Area. So I, t- I thought I'd come out and see if you could play. Come on, come on announced. Uh. Whoa. Yeah. And I said, well, I hope I passed. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, you passed, you know. And what did that lead to? Well, so he said, um, once you get your gear down, then let's talk. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that Don was a producer, mm-hmm. not just for television and stuff, but, you know, with music. Mm-hmm. And he writes songs. and Oh, and wrote songs. A, yeah, yeah. I didn't know you that. You know the artist O'Brien? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember him. Yeah. Don wrote a lot of those songs. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Niceness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And so so the band he put together was me. Uh, there's a bass player named Melvin Davis. Remember? Uh-huh. Yeah, you know Melvin. He's He played with Lee Redden. Now we're all the cast now. He's mm. bad, man. Yeah. So at the time, though, Don's like, I'm putting a band together, and I want you to be in it, and... uh you have to come up to L.A., and uh, I want you guys to do two things. You're going to play for O'Brien. You remember O'Brien, Love Like, Jiggle yeah. mm-hmm. that guy. Mm-hmm. You guys play for him. you be his wow. backing man, but then I'm going to do a record on you guys, too, as well. So that's how I got connected with, with Don. Wow. Wow. And Incredible. so, you know, when you connected with Don, that's TV and yeah. So I was like, whoa, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's a big scoop of ice cream right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. That's TV so anyway, and radio. That's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the short story of how that happened. And then how you have to have some presence of mind, like you said, like when that moment comes. So, like, I know you were excited, but did you feel you could handle it at the time? Or did you feel overwhelmed? Or were you like, I got this? Or how did you feel? No, I didn't. that's what I'm saying. I didn't feel overwhelmed. I, nice. Um, I just knew... And I'm sure Rusty thought the same. When we were young, man, we just loved music and we loved practicing and mm-hmm. playing. It mm-hmm. wasn't about, am I going to make it one day? Not, not am I going to be famous and all the smoke and lights? Oh, like, okay. I wasn't thinking like that. I just knew that I wanted to play. I didn't even know you even got paid for playing. <laughs> That's how innocent I was about yeah. it. Right, right, right. When I right. got my first check, I'm like, "What's this?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, which way did he go, George? I'm like, <laughs> "We get paid for this." Right. Yeah. I love it. You know. That's beautiful. Yeah, man. I remember I got paid twenty dollars for a gig. I thought I made a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's something you love to do. I'm like, I was yeah. just having fun, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but um, so when I saw him there, I was pretty calm because, you know, playing was. Like taking a glass of water. Yeah. You know, right. You it's play natural. all the time. It's just natural. So I just said, well, because I didn't know it was him. Mm-hmm. But I said, well, just in case it's him, let me just put my best foot forward. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and normally your best foot forward is forward all the time. When, when you're young like that and full of fire, man, it's like you got to let that fire out, man. Right. Man. Yeah. It don't matter if it's 10 people in the house or 10,000. It's like, man, I got to do this. Yeah. You got to do it. Mm-hmm. And so the level yeah. is always up. No, it doesn't matter if it's 10 or 10,000. I like how you said that. Yeah. And I know it was a pivotal moment in your life when you were on Soul Train for the first time, right? Yeah. Going on there with Sly. Uh, what was that, 74? And what they usually did, I know, is they would be lip syncing. But you guys played live, right? Yes, absolutely. Sly was the first one to pull that off, as far as I, as far as I know. Was he, he must, I imagine he was the one that stipulated that? I guess so. And I mean, it's like... Normally, if you think about it, Don would 
introduce a band, and they're like standing in place already. He like points to him. We mm -hmm. came up through the crowd and went to the right, stage. Right, you came through the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> um, your boy, uh, Lorden, was it Billy Lorden on drums, right? Yeah. He was on the stage. And uh, Rose and Vet. Rose and Vet were on there too, and kind of got a, like a vamp going. Yeah, yeah. Then you guys, how did you feel coming through the crowd, the people? I, on the I, I, I was just full of energy. I mean, I wasn't seeing nothing really. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was just like, Tunnel get vision. to the stage, man, go, you know. What was the preparation like for that show? Um, I had I, I have notes that, like, you were woodshedding, like, big time, like, bring your lunch. Yeah, yeah, we, Sly rehearsed this very well. We were at, at SIR on uh, Santa Monica, mm -hmm. and I, he rehearsed this hard. He was like, you know, he wasn't playing. Right, right. I, I saw, like, maybe he even got mad a couple times, like, come on. Yeah, you know, stuff's not uh, happening at the... Uh, level that it should be happening, you know, he'll he'll voice his opinion about it. But uh yeah, he rehearsed us well. We were like ready for that show. Wow, man. So at, that actually makes me think. So as a band leader, how do you think he rated as far as just getting like the musicians to focus and stuff? Like what what would be his like method? Um to pick the right guys. Uh-huh. That's it. Pick oh okay, got you. Yeah. So pick the like kind of cast the right people almost cast like casting right a movie. Yeah, cast the right people. God, oh yeah, it's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, your family must have been like over the moon for you. Everybody must have been congratulating you. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really cool. My, and my mom was, uh, was so I say, making mama happy. Daddy liked it like that. Papa liked it like that. <laughs> Thankful and thoughtful, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, my mom used to call me, uh, she, you know, I had two brothers and two, uh, and two sisters. And, uh, my mom would tell me that. I was the adventurous one, and I was, man. I'd, you know, get on the bus at 12 years old and ride all the way downtown Oakland. And, <laughs> and you know, there would be those, you know, bands down there playing in those lofts and stuff, and I'd just be like you hang out outside, right? Yeah, man, midnight and stuff, you know, and ride the bus back home and you know, <laughs> wow. fear, fearless, man, you know. And, yeah, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah you can care because you just wanted to hear that, right? Yeah, yeah, I had to hear it. One mm -hmm. thing, one thing. Uh, speaking of Sly as a band leader, one thing that I caught that you said one time, Levi, as you said, if Prince, talking about, I'm jumping ahead to Prince. If Prince saw something, you guys would be looking at something like everybody in the band and you saw it this way. And then you said Prince would see it a totally different way. Could you exp like explain that or give me an example? Like he would size something up differently, in other words, than the rest of the band would. Like how would that manifest uh -huh. itself? Like criticism, like idea, like. Well, Pr Pr Prince is, a, I mean, he's just a walking computer too, you know. A walking computer, but but a very cool computer though, vibey. <laughs> and so as soon as he walk, it comes into any atmosphere, he's like, e -ke -de 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 -de. you can hear the little computer sounds, you know. Uh. And he's observing how you talk and what you're talking about, who can really play, who really can't. Got you. Uh -huh. you know, he's drummer, clocking like, all that because he's thinking like, if I was to sit in, would that be cool? God, okay. Because if I can't hear myself in front of that, I'm not going up there. Yeah. Mm. But he's making those evaluations because, you know, when he's when he's in a musical situation, people want him to play. Yeah. That's the right. next question. Right, right, right. Go mm. play, play. And Prince, I ain't getting up in front of them cats. <laughs> right, if the right. band is tight and it's funky, he'll be the first one up there. Yeah. Okay. So he's always he's always absorbing and and uh, evaluating things. I call Prince the great editor. The great editor. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, you know, and Don Cornelius said the same thing. You know, he said, look, Levi, life ain't about being the best. Just keep getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work. Mm. I love that. Keep getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work. And you're right. That's editing. Be, what's left is what works. That's the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's what Prince was doing. Wow. So you're soaking that up. But you you started in Sheila E's band, right? And on, as a bass player. Well, okay, is that you how it go worked? even further back because I was in Sheila's band, her her fusion band. Oh, you were in her fusion band. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was the very first thing. That's how I got to even know her. Oh, uh, she, oh, oh. you know, she was having auditions back in the day, and and somebody told her about me, and I I got to the club gig, you know. So we jamming to just. Playing as fast as we can. <laughs> 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 song one, song two. <laughs> yeah. You know every every beat in the world. Oh, boy. And so I got to know I got to know her through that one. But she 
She said, oh, you got some funk chops and some R&B stuff. So she was starting to ease into, you know, as George Duke was, too. Oh, nice. Right. You know, George right. Duke had some great R&B right. stuff. Right. Dookie, right. Dookie stick. So a lot, of the, a lot of the great musicians were like, hey, that's cool. We do all of that. But we need to pay the bills. So right, let's, right, let's right. Ease right. it down a little bit. Smooth it out. Yeah. And so... um. Um, so what, what happened next after that is, pr- uh, not Prince, um, she got a call from Marvin Gaye's people that they wanted her to play percussion on his tour. Right. So Sheila left. Mm-hmm. She left town. Shortly after that, her and Prince connected, and they did the Glamorous Life. So when she came back home a year later, she was Sheila E., not just Sheila Escovito anymore, you know? Right, right, right. right. And so um, I hadn't seen her in a year or so. I said, well, let me let me uh, go over to SIR the rehearsal and see what because she had a band at this time for Glamorous Life because uh, you know they went on the Purple Rain tour and all that stuff. So, but she was starting a new band, so I I, I didn't know that. I was just going to see her, so I went over to SIR and I noticed a lot of people, man, every people all around the block. So when I finally got in in there. I said, what's going on today? She said, first of all, hi, how you doing? What's going on? Oh, I'm having auditions today. I said, oh, really? Oh, I just came to say hi, but uh, can I hang out with you? She said, yeah. So we sat there, uh, and I listened to maybe 20 people audition that day. Oh, okay. She, she wasn't really, she wasn't happy with what she was getting. Mm-hmm. Really? And, and it was for bass player. Mm-hmm. And so she says, you know, I heard you play a little bit of bass. She said, I ain't, I ain't getting what I want anyway, so why don't you audition? Mm. And I said, ah, I don't know. She, she said, just go on audition. So the song was Love Bazaar. That ah. that that tune <laughs> is one of the simplest tunes, but Love that if song. you don't play the feel right, it, 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 you could jack up the bass line yep. because oh. it's, it's 90% feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I kind of, I was like, okay, she, okay. So I went up there, and she said, okay, audition over. Stop it, man. <laughs> and she looked at me and she's like, I said, why don't you stop the audition for? You got the gig if you want it. I know you're a guitar player because that's what she knew of me first. But if you want the bass gig, you got it. Wow. She said, I need bass right now. Wow. And that's how it happened. Was that at the SIR on Folsom that's, in San Francisco? Yeah, the one that's close to the bridge. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. That's it. How long were you playing bass then for before you... Went to the new power generation. Did that last a long time? I was or? with Sheila. So I did this. This was my pattern. So I went in Sheila's band as a bass player. And then uh, when uh, Steph uh, Birnbaum, mm-hmm. he plays with um, Huey Lewis. Uh-huh. Yeah, great guitar player. He was on guitar then. Really? So, yeah, I was on bass. He was on guitar. Uh-huh. But then when he left, she just said, well, if you want to go back to guitar, cool. Mm. Wow. And that's when we brought in Raphael Sadiq. Yeah. Okay. Wow. On the bass. And Carl. Yeah. On the keys. Okay. Wow, man. So, that's amazing. Yeah, and uh, so Tim. Tim Riley, the, uh, the drummer in the Tonys. Okay. They did that same thing at Soundwave. Yeah. The same the same audition thing. And oh, audition. I remember you told yeah. Oh, okay. and, yeah, so if anybody that. listened to that episode, they yeah, can yeah. T- tell, you know, listen to what I was talking about. But, man, on the Black album, you... No, it was in the concert when you was doing your black album solo, or whatever. Did you detune the bass? You talking, oh, you talking about the signing times? Yeah, tour? one of them tours. You you got it's your solo. Yeah, and you doing something. The bass is like down. Did you are you detuning it or some shit? Because it was funky. As <laughs> man, or pitch trend. Ooh, it was or... something. No, he he did something because he had the bass down like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had two ways of doing that. That's um, well, one, one, you know, one, one way I'd just be playing and I'd just drop it. Okay. Like just spin it, you know. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, um, and just detune it myself. Yeah. And then later on, uh, this was before they had, you know, they got the levers now. Uh huh. The you drop, just drop thing. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that shit was the, bad. The ass. old school way was just to detune it. Yeah, yeah, let it just keep rumbling. <laughs> Man, that shit. That it was, was it was and it was like maybe super califragile something funky yeah, yeah. maybe I think it was on that on yeah, that yeah. song that shit was bad watch that shit man no joke by the way man I want to ask you um, you're doing uh, you're playing cello right 
Uh, upright. You're playing upright? Yeah. Mm. How's, how has that been, man? How does that feel? How many years you've been doing that? He was talking to me earlier. He has a private teacher. Oh, really? Yeah. I've been, yeah. I've been doing it now a couple of years now uh, over at Delta College. Um, someone, um, I was taking the uh, jazz combo in the jazz orchestra, and someone, I think, uh, uh, Allie, Allie Costa, she plays clarinet. She said, you ought, to, you ought to take the symphonic band. I said, really? Okay. So I signed <laughs> up for it, right? And Next thing I know, man, I'm like reading these parts and man, it's just it's just so challenging, but it's like demanding, man. You know, you gotta put in some work, you know, yeah. to really get some sound out of the instrument, some intonation and mm. uh and then, you know, uh, a lot of that symphonic band stuff has a lot of time signature changes and key changes. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was like, man. I'm gonna need some new eyes after all of this, man. Cause you know, <laughs> you gotta look out for the for the for the key change, you gotta look out for the form, you know, right. the repeat signs, all kind of stuff, man. Some of those pieces are like two hundred and four bars long, mm. man. You how, know. How many pieces are you playing with? Uh in the symphonic band? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's about um twenty, twenty-five. Wow. Yeah. There's like wow. there's like flutes, flutes, you know, woodwinds, yeah. everything. You're using a bow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like reprogramming your mind, right? Yeah. Just like how everything is it's, similar but so different. Yeah, right? and it, and it, my, my mindset was if I can, like, you know, get some intonation and get some technique, right. maybe I can play a little jazz on it. So, no doubt. So that's that's been my uh, And it's it's motive. never too late. You hear that, guys, to just pick up stuff new. Keep exploring. Right. Keep expanding your yeah. repertoire on what you could do. That's right, man. You just don't like Knowledge is power. Your lawyer, laurels, right. man. Yeah. You know, and just think, man, this is it. It ain't never it. You know. It ain't never it. It ain't never it. I'm getting that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Speaking of uh, it ain't never it, let's get some music in here. We're going to get some musicians in here uh, to play the song, You're the One. I, li I like this. It's like a twist on I'm the One, you know, the little sister tune. Yeah, yeah. And we're going uh, to have them come in and perform the song, You're the One. I'm going to ask them a few more questions when we come back. Smell you later, y'all. Smell you later. Before you knew You're the one 
exist And this opportunity here, the one I can't miss I can feel it in the air, I swear, shout out Benny Siegel Blinded by your love, it's like you can't do no evil You're just ordinary people, I'm a legend like John Girl, come and sit with me, this down Perry on This one lifestyle every day that we own Real talk, I ain't never been no con Artist, with anything I drop, I'm the hardest You chose to mess with me, I knew you was the smartest Stupid cock back and he clearly hit his target Don't mention finish lines, we just getting started You the one, you the one, there you go Said it twice so you already know I ain't even gotta say that you go Cause every time you come around for second time go All right, you guys are funky. You got the vibe. I am so happy to have these two gentlemen here, Rusty Allen and Levi Searser. You know, um, Rusty, you know, I know you grew up in Sobrani Park, um, moving over from Monroe, Louisiana, and your dad used to work at the Naval Base. When did you start playing bass? You played it as a really young man, right? Well, uh, yeah. I was, Actually, I was playing guitar around 12, 13 years oh, old. Oh, guitar, okay. But... uh. Uh, I I kind of like got into the guitar, but you know we needed a bass player with my little friend, so I would just play the first four strings. I didn't even know a bass <laughs> a bass existed yet, right, you right. know. And then until I was, some years later, I found out that uh, oh, there's a such thing as a bass for the low notes. Okay, mom, can you get me a bass? <laughs> <laughs> and you got your first one was a St. George, like yeah, a Fender copy. Yeah, she bought me a St. George bass and a St. George <laughs> yeah, bass piggyback. They the old piggyback basement amps, you know, mm-hmm. like the Fenders, but it, it was a St. George. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good old uh, just a notch above. <laughs> and I remember you told us you were speaking before, but you take that on the bus with you, right? Man, I rehearsals. wanted to play, man. What nothing gonna stop me from playing, man? And <laughs> I had some friends in West Oakland, you know, Greg Crockett and yeah. Yeah, yeah, Nicky Deer and all them. Yeah, I used to catch a bus and put all that stuff on the bus and carry it down the street oh to West God. Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> Dedication. And um, I know you were turned out by like Ray Charles, Johnny Lee Hooker, Howlin' Wolf. Like that, that guy really got you into the music. Yeah, my mom and them would play those records, man. And that's, that's how I really got into uh, feeling what the blues was supposed to feel like, you know? Yeah, man. And I know you got. You really got a feel when you saw James Brown um, at the Oakland Auditorium, too. Yes, indeed, right? man. I got to see that stuff close and up front, man. It's like talking about intensity and power, man, and just, just you know, excellence, man. You know, I mean, execution. You know, James didn't play either, man. It's like, you know, you got to come up here and just let him have it, man. And he right. did, you know. Right, yeah. right. So it was great, man, to be able to experience that stuff at a young age, you know. I have a book on James Brown that's called Kill Him and Leave, you know. Oh, <laughs> dude, really? Yeah, yeah. Just do the that's, show and just get off the stage. Kill him yeah. and leave. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, and I know you, your boy, uh, Ronnie Duffy, used to play with, you said he had a beautiful, like kind of like Chuck yeah, Berry-style yeah. guitar yeah, and yeah, stuff, so you yeah. thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, he's the one that made me want to play, man, because he had his little Sears and Roebuck amp on the on the porch <laughs> with his red guitar. Playing Chuck Berry okay. stuff. I was like, ooh, that sounds cool. I think I want to do that. Now, when... Um, when you were finally seen by the Sly family, when they got became aware with you, was that when you were th- with Johnny Talbot? Is that what yeah. you were? Okay, yeah, I was still playing with Johnny, and uh, he was pretty big. Yeah, Johnny Talbot was, uh, you know, kind of like in the vanguard of the funk bands in the uh, mid to late '60s in Oakland. Why? And stuff. What? Let me ask you about that. Why would you say he was on the vanguard? Like, what was he doing that was kind of just his funk and his feel, man, and his his music, man. Ooh, I mean, yeah, he used. Uh, you know, he always had a two-piece horn section, you know, and uh, he did things that uh, like slide. Reg- regular bands wouldn't do. Like, you know, the music stops and the bass would do a little break and then it's starting. People would, they would refuse to play that type of stuff, right? Right, right, right. they didn't right, think right. it was right. It's like, no, we're not supposed to stop and the bass keep going, you know. You're like, no, 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 it's cool. Just yeah. check it out. Yeah. Yeah, just, just do it, man, and you'll see. <laughs> and, man, there's a song called uh, Do What You Want to Do, man, and it's like it does exactly that. But Johnny... Was in the forefront, him and uh, the Whispers and Johnny and oh, all the them. Whispers too. Yeah, yeah, they were they were all like you know happening at, at the time. And uh, mm-hmm. Johnny Hartsman, that's what I was thinking of. And uh, Faye Carroll and all those man, I got to play with all those people. Beautiful. Why didn't um, 
like Johnny did why did Johnny Talbot not really cross over as far as like because all the musicians like you always remember him talk about him but then the grand scheme of things it's like it like his popularity falls off as far as like the remembrance is that just like an oversight or why do you think that didn't I think it was by not choice. Enough people talk about him. By I think, choice? I think it was by choice because uh, Johnny uh, opened up for Marvin Gaye a few times at the Coliseum, and uh, Marvin Gaye took a liking to Johnny, right? And uh, Motown was looking at looking at him to sign him and everything, right? And, and uh, Marvin told him not to sign with Motown, and he took he Mar- and he and Mar- he took Marvin's advice and didn't sign with him, right? And uh, so Talbot got offered a Motown deal. Yeah, he turned it down. So. I mean, it was like by choice that, you know, and then when I, t- I talked to him all the time, it's like, you know, there's no telling what my life would have ended up like had I, you know, b- bought into their, you know, into their stuff, you know. Right. Because I'm sure he would have been exploited some type of way. And he kind of like saw that coming and Marvin warned him about it too because, you know, they was That's jacking heavy. over Marvin too. Right, you know, right, right, right. So he was like, man, I'll sign with them. And so, you know. Um, That's interesting. I always but, wondered about that. Yeah, but in the community, he was huge. You know, right? In the Oakland, Richmond, San Francisco community. Johnny was huge. Right, wow. right. You ran. That's how you joined the band because you like ran out, ran up to him in the street, didn't you? Yeah. You saw him like- <laughs> that's why I'm getting his shoes shined. I was like, I want to play. <laughs> <laughs> I want to play, and I cut my first record with him. It was called uh, Get Some. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, how was he as a band leader? Did you used to push and pull with him? You know, sometimes when you're young, or did were you just like yes, like everything he said? Yes. Because mm-hmm. he knew, man. I mean, you know, he had wisdom and everything. It's like, you know, I remember we were having a rehearsal at the campus club one one day, one afternoon, and there was no drummer. The drummer didn't show up. But somebody said we. Sh- we going home, right? He said, "No, we ain't going home. We finna rehearse still with, with no drummer. Yeah, without no drummer." So I got those kind of things put in me. You right, know. right. Uh, we yeah. can still do it. Yeah, we can still do this, regardless. You know, you come here and do your job. Right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Come here and do your job. Play your I part. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. your part. Play your part. And you saw, so you were kind of in the in the in the cooker, and then you saw the night that Larry Graham just decided to leave, like something like he threw like his tambourine and like walk off the stage. Yeah, I like, saw. I saw the whole thing kind of like. Come to the final explosion at the Cow Palace. They at the Cow Palace. Yeah, they were like uh, doing a show, and Sly came out, and you know they were like after Woodstock and everything. And Sly was like, "I right. can't, I can't deal with this." He stayed on stage for maybe five minutes or so and walked off. And so the band left. You know, at this point, we were playing with Little Sister and stuff too. So you know, we were able to stand in the wings and right on stage and see everything oh. up front. And mm. so Sly left, and then so we came down off the stage, and Larry came down and. Tossed that tamarind was pissed. <laughs> right. So that was like a beginning of the end right there. And one thing I didn't know that I saw on your show that uh, you were talking about with Levi, I didn't realize that you kind of did have a little bit. I thought you were just always in there, but you had a little bit of competition with uh, uh, Warnell Jones. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he, he was kind of in the mix and maybe join a slide too. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. Warnell Jones, who played bass for the Young Senators, they were backing right. up Eddie Kendricks. Right, the Eddie uh, Kendricks band. Yeah, and did it, he was he in Sly at all, or did he do gigs with him? He, uh, well, I mean, he was at the audition, and the audition was in front of 30,000 people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it was me. Is that and, the gig in Virginia, you yeah, mean? Okay, yeah. okay. Wow. Yeah, and it was me and Mornell and this other guy, just like dude. Oh, then, so was it like in the same the same uh, gig, like you did like a couple songs? and Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and, 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 and Mornell, he was, you know, he was a bad boy, you know. Did you guys get along, or were you like... Like an, you know, like what, bumping the, elbows like backstage, like Ugh. no, 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 nothing like that, <laughs> <laughs> nothing like that. It's like you know, when it's your turn to play, just go play, right? You know, but like, you know, I thought Warnell did great, you know, but um, being raised and kind of nurtured and you know molded in that slide thing from little sister and all that, I kind of like, I think I had a more of a feel of more, what slide yeah. was looking for. Right. Mm-hmm. That's that's why I got to. You get. had more of that family affair kind yeah. of vibe, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, one and one thing about like being a person that was like brought into the fold that really fascinates me also about you, Levi, is like Prince, like like Sly, like he wants it to be a family thing. He's like, okay, you sing this part, you sing this part. Prince, a lot of what he did was also self-contained, although he's fantastic live. You know, as far as like recording, coming up with songs. At some point, you got. We kind of, as the way we see it, uh, Jay and I, like kind of a co-pilot on a lot of that stuff. 
I mean, Prince, I mean, how do you, how did you get into his mind like that? Or how did he put you on? Like, he seems very, like you said, very picky, very particular. What did he like about what you were bringing? I never tried to change Prince's sound. Sometimes, you you, you know, because okay. Prince was around a lot of incredible musicians. Right. But sometimes, you know, when people come in, they go, I want to now do this. that I'm in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should be doing this. Right, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> and I actually got I'll ask this question a lot of, a lot of times. Well, how did, how did it work? I said I didn't try to change anything. Right. Yeah. He, he, he already has a sound, which is clearly working. <laughs> Why would I come in and say, let's build this new train track? Yeah, right. You right, know, right I'm right. not proven. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? So my thing was like, how can I take some of the heavy lifting off of him? So, what would that uh, be like? Like, what would be heavy lifting? Well, in my mind, and nothing was heavy because he could do everything by himself. Uh, right, gotcha. But in my mind, heavy lifting would be because Prince was always recording for different people. So I said, well, you know, when I send, if I want him to listen to my music, what would probably catch his attention more is if I bring in something that he might do, but he didn't have to do it. So that takes some load off, you know? Because mm-hmm. so Prince would always tell me, hey, um, I'm working on this artist or that artist, and I'm in the studio after rehearsal. An hour after our rehearsal finished, he was always in the studio. He said, I know you like to produce and write, so if, if I see you there, then I know you're serious. I said, I'm going to beat you there. <laughs> and I was like, what are we doing today, boss? <laughs> and so then after, you know, maybe three, four months of that, I was like, do you mind if I submit some stuff just to, just to see, you know, help me out, tell me from... He said, sure. He really? said, don't get mad if I don't like it. Yeah. He said that. Yeah. Because, mm. see, he had heard some of my stuff with Sheila. Yeah. So he knew I wasn't going to just bring anything in there. Right. But um, he, he gave me that opportunity, and I said, you know what, thanks for that. That's all I need. I just need an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Levi told me a story, too. I think that Prince had a... a there was a mutual respect there because, you know, just like with me with Sly, when Sly was coming down the hall and I didn't look at him, he was like, bro, didn't even look at me. <laughs> well, 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 Levi didn't bow down to Prince like, you know, Prince would right, expect everybody right, right, to right, do, right? right? As a matter of fact, Levi told me this story about uh, they were on the road and something went on and and uh, Levi, Levi was playing bass and he was like, well, I don't know how you're going to do a show without no bass player. And, and Prince thought he was bluffing, right? And Levi was getting ready to go to the airport. He's like, this man is for real, man. He finna just leave me. Don't nobody do that unless they got some real balls. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, so, so I think Prince had a, a real deep respect for this man. You know what I'm no saying? No doubt. Yeah. And it's speaking of deep respect, it just goes around a circle, like I said earlier, because now you guys are doing the purple ones. When I know, I know Prince is fully inspired by Sly. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now yeah. it's like you're giving it back. Yeah. It's, it's, just a, it's such a beautiful it's thing. It's just one circle. Yeah, it's just mm-hmm. one circle, man. Mm-hmm. One, one more thing I was wondering about as far as like Prince is, how would, how would the band respond to different eras? Because Sly has his sound, but Prince, it seems like every time you do a new album, like, you know, Sign of the Times, now it's Love Sexy, Graffiti Bitch, it's like a whole concept. Which is a little like different than what he put out last time. Yeah. As as band members, was everybody just like, "Oh, this is great," or were some people like, "Oh, I like." It was it hard to hear the style or the style changes. That's why or? you put us in the band. <laughs> mm-hmm. So pick the right people, yeah, right? Because I'll tell Here you a funny is. story, yeah. man. So when you know after I joined Prince's band, you know we had rehearsed a couple of months, and every musician in Minneapolis hated us. <laughs> man, I'm I serious, bet, man. dude. I remember uh, after I joined this band, we had been rehearsing a couple of weeks, and so I said, you know, it was one. I don't normally go out and rest, you know. I don't never really go out unless uh, I'm playing. Yeah. But I said, let me go out to First Avenue and see what's going on. And it was the weirdest experience because I thought I saw three Jesse Johnsons and okay. three Princes, <laughs> okay. three Mark Browns, about 10 Vanity Sixes. Wow. You know, they, everybody was in full, like it was full Halloween, effect. bro. Okay. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell is going on? So I'm sitting at the table, but they're all talking. So these three brothers was at the bar. They were like, man, who is this Levi Cat? Because, mm. you know, Prince, man, 
Why do you have to go out of town, man, to get some musicians? Man, we've been, right. oh, we've okay. been here the whole time. Right, right, it's right. Bay Area practicing, hey. I bu- actually bumping into him. Like, give me a shot, Prince. And he done went all the way to the other side and brought these cats in. Bay man, I don't know. Bay Area's so, got that secret. It's that water. So I was like, I better I better get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I left him. About, but uh, maybe three weeks later, we actually, pr- pr- Prince premiered the band at the First Avenue. And I'm oh. like, boy, here we go. Uh-huh. Wow. You know, but anyway, we kicked, we kicked ass. How did you feel before <laughs> that, that show? That. Like, it must uh, have been. I, I wasn't nervous. Right. I mean, I, I I knew the the funk was there. Yeah, yeah. Was, and we we brought a Bay Area sound. No doubt to Minneapolis. Uh, yeah, That's yeah. That's heavy duty. And so I'm gonna get to what we're bringing full circle. Yeah, yeah. So man, we was on fire that night. So Prince Prince was on stage, and you know he was in his James Brown mode. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, if it ain't from Minneapolis, it ain't shit. <laughs> and I'm looking around. I'm looking at Miko. I'm uh, like, where you from? Uh, <laughs> Oakland, Bonnie, where you from? Right. Sheila, where you from? <laughs> what you talking about Minneapolis? <laughs> it's Oakland up in here. Right. You know? <laughs> and I used to throw that in his face all the time. Yeah. No <laughs> doubt. Because uh, to tie into the Sly thing, he, he was very fascinated with Sly. Right, I say, Prince, right. man, my mother went to church with Sly. Ooh. Mm. What? <laughs> I said, yeah, Geeked man. That, huh? I said, Prince, don't get me wrong. Like, you're incredible to me. I was wondering, though, when I first heard about you, how did you get our sound in Minneapolis? Because Minneapolis from California looked boring to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I'm like, right, right, right. Where are you getting this kind of fire that you got? In the land of snow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Fire from snow. Right, right. I'm like, oh, man. And he said, your mother went to church. I said, yeah, man. So everything we plan is kind of like, that's backyard talk to us. Mm-hmm, you know, we, mm-hmm. That's how we yep, do it. Right, yep, yep. right. Yeah. No, and no. if you look at a lot of musicians that, Half of them was from Cali. All of them. Right. Wow. All he was tried, He tried to be Sly himself one time. <laughs> I saw him on Good Morning <laughs> America. Uh-huh. He had half of Sly's band up there. Yeah. And then he was in a, And I'm like, you supposed to be Sly? Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. We had one, a couple of the horns. Yeah. And, no yeah. doubt. Man, I was like, Larry was there. I'm like. For sure. Dang. Yeah. Was there anything, speaking of that, this is making me think. When you were doing fresh, the fresh sessions, right? How did you feel? Was it that like tense? Because it's like, it's a different rhythm section. You know, you're, you're feeling it. Larry Graham and Greg Arico is that. It was me and Andy. And, and, but Andy, oh, it's you and Andy. Yeah, I just emailed Andy too. He's doing ah, well. he lives in, Shout he, out. He's living in England right now. And oh, really? He's not playing that much, but yeah, we emailed each other. But shout anyway, out to Andy. No, man. It was like, it's like Levi said. I mean, that, that was in me. You know, uh, from being with little sister and and playing with Johnny Talbot and playing blues and whatever, and so this the fresh sessions was just, you know, Sly gave me an idea and I said okay. And he started the tape and I just played, <laughs> and uh, I think I punched in one time. Ooh, wow, wow! And then when you recorded that, would uh, would you do you? I think you just said you just do very few takes. Yeah, I mean. Um, the the first takes are the best ones usually anyway. Yeah. But uh yeah, it it didn't take it didn't take long. It was just just something that just kinda happened, man, you know. And I said before, I'll say it again, I know a reading in some Miles Davis biography that he would like he would like make his band just listen to in time as like a less like listen to this. Yeah, I heard about like, that too. Pay, yeah. Yeah, pay attention to this. Yeah. I, you got that crazy story about uh Miles uh <laughs> <laughs> Riding around in his car, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, Miles Davis, man. And My- Miles, he threw. Didn't he throw Sly out of his house one time for playing like a? No, Sly threw Miles out. A of Sly his threw house. Miles. <laughs> I can't believe that. Yeah, man. Yeah, I was there, man. Um, Sly had that apartment at Twenty Five Central Park West, and, uh-huh. and uh, Miles came by, and me and Freddie had been hanging out with Miles earlier that week, and so. Miles decided to come by, and so <laughs> Sly had a nice little studio in the apartment, and Miles saw saw his uh, organ sitting there, a Yamaha organ or something. And he starts like playing these like nine and ten note chords and moving this stuff around, <laughs> and Sly comes out the back room, <laughs> and so throws a fit, man, <laughs> and says, "Man, who in the?" 
<laughs> and it was like, get your ass off me. Get out, man. And so, and Miles, you know, he looks so dejected and everything. Because, you know, Miles was trying to be a superstar, too. He was like, right, right, yeah. right. you know, how come, you know, at one of those festivals, Miles had like, you know, six, 7,000 people. And Sly had 30,000. He's like, man, how, I want that. Right, right. That's right. why he started dressing right. that way and everything, right? Okay. But he, Miles looked so dejected. And I was like, Sly, man. That was Miles Davis you was talking to, man. <laughs> I don't give a... <laughs> <laughs> playing, playing all of that voodoo <laughs> on my organ? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> and that always makes me laugh because Miles is so tough himself. You know, he's a... <laughs> Man, he himself. walked out like this, man. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> I would pay to see that, man. That's amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so the sessions weren't too bad. It wasn't too tense, and you were digging everything. Yeah. Um, How did you feel when the album came out? It must um, have been amazing. I mean, it's just like a work of art. that's fresh is just so beautiful. Yeah, you know, I mean, it just... Everything was happening. You know, I, I like to think that everything was divinely ordained, man, because uh, from the time I left Sobrani Park and played with Johnny and went to Little Sister and then went to Sly and all the other stuff that came right. after that, even it's just like it didn't it didn't really shock me. I mean, even like, you know, my brother told me, man, you don't know how, how significant what you did. Uh, in the music business was and I was, and like I really still don't still don't mm -hmm. I right. mean because I it don't I don't look at it that way right. plus you're still in it you're still yeah. active yeah and so I'm just you know I'm just a player man of the, you know young <laughs> player that played picked up a bass and still doing it still doing it and that's what I'll be doing till I die you no know? doubt you no know, till I can't do it no more right and that on, ain't man. far away by the way my <laughs> butt is feeling <laughs> <laughs> yeah right on man and, and thank you guys for coming out it's so great talking to you I just want to ask you a couple last things before we go um, so is the last time you saw Sly I have like you saw him at some convention or something like a Sly Stone convention yeah Barry Barry Freeman and uh, 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 Greg Artis uh, they put together a convention at the Fox Theater downtown Oakland mm -hmm. I can't remember what year that was. Um, maybe five years ago, okay. something like that. And and uh, they set up the uh, panels, the panel discussions, and they had the Family Stone. Uh, they had a little sister, you know, and I sat on their panel. Um, oh, some, nice. Somebody uh, blocked me from sitting on Sly's panel, but I won't go into any details uh, about that. Ooh. Yeah, but uh yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, they set it up and, and Sly showed up, man, and I almost missed him, man, you know, cuz you know, he was talking and then we were uh little sister was being interviewed and everything and Sly was getting into his limo to go to leave. And I was like, "Where's Sly?" And it was like, "He's leaving." And I ran outside, man, and he was just getting ready to pull off, man. I opened the door and I just stuck my whole body in the car and just hugged him. And that's oh, the last nice. time I saw him. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. What what made you guys decide to start doing the the YouTube show together? I like the I love the shows you do, having a conversation about this little anecdote here and there. What made you decide to start doing that? Well, um, it was actually a brainstorm of uh, my manager Barry Freeman. Uh huh. Crit. Um, he was like, "Yeah, I mean, we need to you know try to reach a fan base and try to develop a fan base, and this is one of the ways you can do it." And I said, "Okay, whatever you say." So, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted Levi with me, you know. Uh, Levi brought me into the um, Purple Ones, and he's been doing a lot of stuff, man, a lot of stuff behind the scenes that people don't even know about. And don't ask for nothing, man, you know. So and even with this, man, it's like he don't have to do that. But uh, uh, we just went ahead and done it, and we're having some success. We have a lot more episodes to shoot, and, you know, we're just going to continue and try to build a fan base in the hopes of uh, developing a large enough fan base to go out and do some shows. Mm -hmm. That's that's so wonderful, yeah. man. I'm just great, great to see you guys as road dogs together. Do you remember what were you doing uh, when when Prince passed away? Like, what what were you doing? Do you remember what was going on and what that oh, was like I, when I you found remember, out? Yeah, like I was going down San Pablo. Uh huh. And um, I was headed to the post office. Beautiful day. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is with beautiful days and tragedies. 9-11 mm -hmm. was like that. Right. Yeah. I remember. I, I was in Minnesota, and I was the sky was so clear mm -hmm. that day. And even in New York, it was clear. Uh -huh. And I'm like, this happening? You know, you would think mm -hmm. it would be on a cloudy day. Or a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. Tragedy. And so I, I um, got the news. 
You know, because people once it hit the wire, you know. Mm -hmm. Spread like but fire. now I had got a call a, a hour earlier from the coroner's office. What? Mm. An yeah. hour earlier? What? What do you mean? What happened? Yeah, because they because they knew they were trying to reach people that they thought was close to close mm -hmm. to print, and they say Levi, look that because you know when it was pre first presented, there was some incident at Paisley Park. Nobody knew what was going on. Right. But somebody had died at Paisley Park. I wasn't thinking Prince. I'm like, right, right, right. it's some crazy some, fan some, that yeah. got up in there. Got you, right. Was doing something crazy. So um, that was the first thing I heard. But then somebody called me from the coroner's office and said, hey, man, that, that was Prince. And I'm like, no. Wow. You so know, and I still registered. wasn't believing it. I'm right. like, nah, they still. But then they when they went on the wire with it worldwide, I was like. Wow. 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 So I pulled over, man, and I was just like, first person I called was Sheila. I couldn't, she, I didn't, wasn't able to reach her. Because wow. she, she was the reason I knew him. Right, right, of course. So I wanted to connect with her and uh, just tell her, I was, you know, man. But the wind was knocked out of me, man. I bet. Because Prince was like, I mean, I, wanna, I don't want to put him on a God level, but... He kind of got that goddish type right. of thing. He's goddish, right? <laughs> goddish, goddish. Yeah, you know, if he came in here right now, it would smell like vanilla. <laughs> right, right, right. And then, no, all of a sudden, everything would just get bright. Yeah. Rose <laughs> petals. On him and everything. Right. Rose petals would appear everywhere. And, and a bunch of helpers. You want some water? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You want a rope? You know? Yeah. Wow. You hungry? You know, that's some just, grapes? That's, that's how it is. Like coming to America for real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like us? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, he had it like that, you know? Yeah. Wow. And, how, uh, how soon after did you decide to do the tribute? Uh, that was about three or four months. Because I mean, I was messed up, man. Like, oh, just three or four months? No, no, no. Before I would play. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I meant like to to do the tr purple ones to like give the tribute. Yeah, them that's the tribute. what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah oh yeah, wow. Yeah. So not that long. Yeah, cause I, you know, like I said earlier, I never go out and hang out. That's like right. going back to the office to me. <laughs> right, right. You know, I don't. I never did that. I'm like, I'm in the studio. You know. Yep. I mm -hmm. see you at the next show. Right. But anyway, but Morty, who's uh the uh, one who put the purple ones together, he had been trying to reach me for four or five years. Not. Not because a Prince died. He wanted to, you know, he's like, oh, man, I, you know, you live in California. We need to do something. And so we finally got connected. And I said, you know what? I haven't been out, and I think it'll help my grieving mm. a little bit mm -hmm. if I go out and be with the fans yeah, and then go play. Not, And I didn't know what That's to expect, cool. man, because right. I just felt like, man, who wants to hear Prince music if he ain't here? Right. Mm -hmm. right. But I was shocked because when I talked to the fans, they were like, that's why we want to hear it. He ain't here. Right. And a lot of people never saw a live Prince concert. They they had listened to the records, mm -hmm. but they never got a chance to feel the energy of, you know, on loudspeakers yeah, and yeah. The, the crowd's energy. You know, it's like you can watch a movie at home, but it's a little different in the cinema. Yeah. Yep. You know, so that's all we try to do. Ain't nobody trying to imitate Prince. Right. It's only one yeah, of him. Right, can't right. do it. Right. Can't do it. Can't so be done. So we just try to, you know, put as much spirit in there as we can. And um, <laughs> it makes me feel good to to be able to do that. I mean, I always say in, in the show, I say, Prince here with us. He listening? Yeah, yeah. Most definitely. You know? He here now. Yeah, he here now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to him a couple of times a week. Yeah. Oh, man. Be, you know, okay. Likewise. Seriously, man. Right, got you. Yeah, yeah. Likewise. Yeah, yeah. Got you. Right on, man. Wow, so, man, uh, that's that's so. I hope beautiful. that answers your question. I, oh, yeah. fully, that fully yeah. answers my question. And you guys, you mean so much to me. Can we ever get? Do we have a recording of Wagtail? By the way, can we get it? Uh, hey, I don't tapes? think so. Oh man, <laughs> what I wanted to just say to you, uh, say to you, Rusty, is thank you so much for helping launch a Stop Podcast, launching our show. Thank both of you, gentlemen, for sharing your lives with us. Um, also, you guys, check out episode 10 of Aced Out Podcast. That's our tribute to Willie Wilde, on which uh, Rusty also takes part and participates with. Uh, I co-hosted that with uh, Chocolate. You guys um, have made it really special. It's an honor to work with you, honor to talk with you. Uh, thank you for giving us your time, uh, you know, giving your butts uh, a little bit of soreness with these chairs. I know you're ready to wrap up the interview. 
And it's just an honor to have you, you here. And, uh, thank you know, you. thank you so much. I'm going to be seeing the purple one soon again. Okay. And uh, have, a, have a safe flight. I know you're going to do your new Power Generation show. You guys, check out Rusty's YouTube show. He's got music. He's remixed Simple Rules. Check this man out. He is happening. He's still hot and he's still working. He has a great sound, great tone. Thank you so much for coming here. I know we had Thank some you, false sir. stars. It's so great yes, to sir. have this uh, this episode again. But one, been wanting to have you back on for years. My blessing, my pleasure, bro. Right on, Trust you me. guys. I say that. Likewise. Yes. What are you going to do the rest of the day? What else are you going to do today? You just going to go no, back oh, home. I got to go over and pack. Go home and pack. Because I ain't put one. I'm gonna keep it real. I'm keep it real. Yeah. <laughs> so All right. I gotta go do that. All right. Know, so. We'll let you get. We'll let you get packing, and yeah. uh, <laughs> hope to see you guys again soon. So thank you okay. for uh, thank, thank you for you, coming man. out. Thank you so much. All right. Thank All right. You. Yes, brother. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Check out next episode, you guys. We're gonna interview the funky professor Uhuru Maggot. Ricky Vincent wrote the funk book. We're gonna talk to him next, y'all. Rick. Rick. Smell you later later <laughs> <laughs> yeah guys he turning in the pool